All right, everybody. Hey, hi. Welcome to Game Boys to Men. I'm Jeff Gerstman. Joining me is Glenn Rubenstein, who came up with the name. Do you want to? Do you want to take that? <laughs> do you want to take back the name before we get started, or are we just too in it? We are using this until we get a cease and desist from uh, Nintendo or potentially uh, Biv Ten Entertainment. That's right. Point. Yeah, uh, and if and, and and we will trade the name to them for the rights to uh, the name Sudden Impact. If they will Absolutely. allow us to to use that, and we can start our R and B group uh, that we've been working on for literal decades. So let's set the this up a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So th this show, we're we're really kind of looking to dig into the archives for real. Um, I've been doing this since you know somewhere around 1992, and Glenn is why. Uh, Glenn and I met in high school. And he got into this before I did, so his story kind of starts a little bit even before mine. Um, and yeah, so the, the the some of the things you can expect to hear on this podcast, which is a Patreon exclusive, you can go to patreon.com slash Jeff Gerstman and the, the co-conspirator tier, you can gain access to every additional episode of this show to follow past this introductory one. So we'll, we'll get into topics like... You know, hey, like imagine a limo showing up to your house uh, and and driving you and a friend to Sega's headquarters so that they can show you Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Or, uh, you know, imagine testifying against Nintendo in court. That happened. Uh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> that, that happened. Uh, <laughs> imagine getting home from high school to discover that you've received like two angry voicemails from video game PR people because of something you said about their game in your local newspaper. Crazy. That's, yeah, this, this was my life. That was yes, that was your life, and uh, you you wrote me into it along the way, uh, through a, a a myriad of different schemes. Is yeah, I don't know. Is, is schemes the right word? We started a rap group and a public access show, and uh, you for a while there, you were still trying to you were you actually were trying to start an R and B group, but maybe we won't get into that. Uh, <laughs> Um, but yeah, and, and, you know, uh, Glenn and I, you know, we, we both were very early in the door at GameSpot back in 96 and all that sort of stuff. And we worked for a magazine in the middle there between all that stuff. Uh, and yeah, so there's a lot of history that is kind of pre or on the cusp of internet history, uh, that we can get into here. So here on this uh, first episode, we really just kind of want to set up kind of set the stage for this stuff. And uh, and go over kind of the the early early days, Glenn. How did you originally get into video games in the first place? Not the business, just like yeah, yeah. I mean, it's weird, man. Like you and I both. I mean, you were born in seventy five. I was born in seventy six. Like yeah. we're the first generation when video games, hip hop computers it was still new but it was starting to become a part of the home we were born around the time it was introduced so by the time we you know entered early childhood this stuff was common and i remember um having the odyssey 2 mm -hmm. you know casey munchkin all the way yep uh oh, yeah. and then starting your gaming career with lawsuits oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh and then getting the atari 400 and 800 i think like a lot of parents it was like oh it's got a keyboard it's a computer i mean yeah. i never owned a 2600 as a kid uh that was seen as too pedestrian uh, mm -hmm. by my parents but uh minor 2049er was probably that was like a family obsession and i don't think anyone in my family ever actually beat that game i think like level nine was always the one that uh that defeated us yeah minor gets hard that was uh that's that's more or less how it went for me early days um as well at least at, at first like we didn't have a 2600 specifically because my mom got fooled into buying a fairchild channel f because uh i think she was told it had some educational things on it but it had a pretty good bowling game uh and then our house flooded in 82 when the whole west side of petaluma flooded and that uh that fairchild was underwater and, and, and destroyed after that. So I, yeah, I had the same deal. I ended up with an Atari 400, not long after that and started going down that path of, of a bunch of different video games. Um, 
Yeah. And uh, I mean, I had an Apple IIe. I think we both had the experience so common in our generation of actually typing in rudimentary computer code from the back of magazines, because God forbid you pay two bucks more to get a disc with the program. No, they're going to give you 30 pages of code that if you mess up one line, your program is busted and you have no clue how to fix it. But, oh, I did that probably a good half dozen times before I said, screw this mm -hmm. and uh, discovered the world of shareware, you know? Yeah, that's that's. uh yeah, I, I was, uh, I got so frustrated and I, I knew like at the time, I think even I, I realized like, I just, I didn't have the patience. It was then and there at the age of like eight or something that I was like, I don't have the patience to be a computer programmer because yeah. I don't have the patience to track down these typos. Uh, and I would, I would lose it. And one time uh, I'm probably on more than one occasion, my mom would go through and look for the typos and find them and fix them for me. Uh, cause she was a saint. <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, I, same type deal probably did that four or five times and i got to a point where you know like every school had an apple II, but i didn't have an apple II yeah. at home and so for a while i just had like two boxes of discs these were the school discs these were the cool apple II games that i brought into school and then these were the atari discs that stayed home uh and yeah yeah just copying and yeah shareware is maybe not the word for what i was into at that point but <sighs> That's putting it politely yeah. but yes i mean I, people were sharing it did oh yeah license too who knows yeah, i don't but, know uh, yeah I was, I was deep into logo on the Apple IIe, but aside yeah. from that, I think the extent of my programming was uh, line 10, print, FU, line 20, go to 10, yep. and then just run that and then leave the computer lab. Yeah. What, what more would you, what more would you need to do? Really? Yeah, That's seriously. just to do that on every computer and then, and then sneak out and leave. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I eventually started going to arcades a lot and I, I'm trying to remember what the, impetus of that was i mean it was pretty clear from an early age that i was very much into video games but i think yeah. also you know that required a parent like my father took me to the arcade uh there was an arcade in in petaluma called dodge city and they used to be uh when they first opened up or when i first went there they were in a an old bank yeah and so they had games inside the vault of the bank which was really cool and uh you know, they eventually moved to the Petaluma Fairgrounds in a much bigger space. And that was by the mid 80s, they were doing that. So that's like when Gauntlet was out and Akari Warriors and, and a lot of stuff like that. My dad, uh, we wouldn't go every weekend, but, you know, it, we, it was most most weekends. I was at least asking him to like, hey, we should go to the arcade. And so I, I yeah. did a lot of I had a lot of arcade trips in addition to uh, the stuff at home. And that that really kind of, I think, rounded me out a little bit to where now I have like a huge, that's what led to me calling that, that arcade years later and, and asking them how much they would sell me their 720 machine for like stuff like that. Like I was like, oh, I, sh I should own an arcade machine. That would be really awesome. Um, and they were like, it's $5,000. And I was like, Oh, okay. Hey mom, can I have 5,000? No, she would not give me $5,000. There were limits. You know, in the 90s, when that 720 machine was at the Phoenix uh -huh. and Dodge City was in its waning days, they offered to sell that to me for like 800 bucks. And I kick myself for not doing it because that is my still to this day, 720 is my favorite arcade game of all time. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really good. And it's one of those games that's hard to play anywhere else just because of mm -hmm. how specific the weird rotary joystick is on that thing and so there there aren't really a ton of really great ways to play it like you can approximate it at home but it's not it's yeah. not the way you want it uh and yeah there was a flight sim stick that had the 360 rotating base that i remember using that in mame like maybe 15 years ago yeah but... It's tough, man. But arcades, I mean, I think people these days don't realize what arcades were to us. I mean, and I don't know if you had the same experience, but when Chuck E. Cheese was still new, yeah, I mean, that was like the ultimate. Like, I'm going to go, I'm going to eat pizza. I'm going to tune out this weird animatronic band. You know, maybe if I want to uh, uh, diversify things, I'll jump in a ball pit, play some skee ball. But then every arcade game you can imagine there for the taking. Yeah, yeah, there was a Chuck E. Cheese up in Santa Rosa. So I mean, you, I mean, you didn't grow up in California, right? You were Midwest. Okay, so this is really weird how this worked. Born in Ohio, moved to Michigan, left Michigan to move to Alameda, about an hour from Petaluma, closer to Silicon Valley. Moved there in 1981. Okay. Lived there till 86. Moved back to Michigan, which was a grim reality for three years. Then moved to Petaluma in 1989, like right before Batman came out. Okay. All right. Yeah. That, 
That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So th- there was a Chuck E. Cheese in, in Santa Rosa for for a good long yeah. time, and they didn't even have the ball pit. Like they didn't. They did not really? devote any real resources to the like. It kind of had the animatronic band, but it was like half of it. It was just like the most trashy like messed up fucked up Chuck E. Cheese that probably ever existed if I had to guess but like they they did it on the arcade machines and so you definitely got a like I got my route down where it's like if I if I wanted to play Hubert you kind of had to go to Chuck E. Cheese like they definitely had a Space Fury machine and a Donkey Kong Jr. but Dodge City made you know didn't have that but they had Turbo and then there was a place in Katati that had a, a red alert machine and then there was Aladdin's Castle in the mall in Santa Rosa yeah, and they yeah, had a kung. They, yeah, they, yeah, they had they had kung fu master there, and so and mouse trap and some other stuff like that. So it, it became this thing of like, well, uh, you know, it's I don't know if I can talk my dad into making the drive, the the, the ten minute drive when when there's really an arcade up the street. It's like literally right there. But I'm be like, hey, what if instead we drove the the twelve minutes to Santa Rosa and went to the mall and instead played these other games? And sometimes he would go for it, sometimes he wouldn't. But yeah, I, I definitely tried to keep it on. A rotation. I think the other the other missing piece that I think for a lot of people these days is that arcade machines were just technologically more powerful than the home machines. That's something yeah. that kept up probably until the PlayStation. If I had to, you know, you know, if I had to put a, a time frame on it, that's that's really when you started getting like like it was like Tekken and Tekken Two were just like, oh, these are far better games at home than they were in yeah. arcades and so you went through all of the 80s knowing that like the real versions of these games were in arcades and you weren't going to get them at home or if you did they would have to be dramatically different um, yeah and that was the f- initial selling point of the 16-bit systems the idea with the genesis that it was going to be easier to port that what nec yeah. was doing with the turbo graphics i mean it's it's so weird to think about a pre-internet world where arcades were the cutting edge of video gaming yeah it's uh especially i think you know i think that's something that's lost on people that go back to those games now like that context is definitely missing because you're just like you play them now and you're like oh wow mobile games are like more complicated and in depth or like you know there were a lot of flash games in the flash game era that were probably deeper than a lot of those games were in in arcades you know and and so yeah that that's definitely like a piece of a piece of context that that really gets lost but you know kind of i i went through the you know the the quote unquote like crash of the industry like when you know in 83 when the 2600 dropped out when the bottom dropped out of home video games i went through that time continued can i just you know because i had a computer you know i had an atari and then eventually i got a commodore 64 like it it didn't feel like video games went away through that time period you know it was like there were still out there there was still plenty to do the arcades were a little bit different. They started to get a little more grim and a little bit more in like grabby on your quarters uh, where you started to see stuff like, you know, as, as the eighties wore on, you started getting, you know, Konami's beat em ups like Ninja Turtles and stuff like that. More and more games that were just like, Hey, you should put more money into this and continue like, Hey, you're going to yeah. spend $4 finishing golden ax or something like that or afterburner or, or whatever. And you know, they, they really tried to find more and more ways to just kind of suck more money out of players until we got to NBA Jam, where they mastered it, I think, um, of just like getting as much money as they they possibly could. Um, I, rem- I remember Dragon's Lair was the first like two quarter game there. In fact, I think it was four quarters. Yeah, so it yeah, it was a, in Petaluma. It was a dollar. Yeah, it was definitely yeah. like uh, my dad. So my dad became very drawn to Dragon's Lair when it came out. Um, for whatever reason, and there would be times, you know, there would be trips to Dodge City where he, all he would do the entire time is play Dragon's Lair and he would finish it. Uh, you know, he, he was, he was the first person I ever saw finish Dragon's Lair. Uh, but I just, even, even then I looked at that thing and just went, that's not even a video game. What is this? This is, this is a joke, right? Like, come on over here. I can run and shoot and do all this stuff. And when I hit the buttons, things happen. Like you could tell. Like, oh, behind the scenes, it's you push this thing and it's just like skipping a track and playing this instead. This is fake. Like, yeah, I, just, I didn't like it. When uh, we get to do an episode about quote unquote multimedia yeah. and 93 to 96, uh, oh, oh, what Dragon's Lair right. rot. 
sort yeah. of quick time event and that genre of games that at varying times, I think everyone's bought into on some level. Um, and if done well, it could be fun once, but right. yeah, it's not really a game. No, no. And that's, uh, yeah, we'll, 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 yes, we will definitely get into that later because everything I remember about uh, there, there was just a period of time where every time I went over to your house, there was like another bad multimedia system and another bad stack of discs, whether it was the CD TV <laughs> or the CDI, um, you know, it, or in some cases the 3DO, I think went down that road a little bit as well, but like, you know, th but there was definitely like that, that period of time where it was just like, God, here's like one more thing that is completely ill suited at playing video games that they are desperately attempting to be like, it runs in Carta, but also you can shoot stuff. Hey, uh, Philip CDI Golf was very, <laughs> very good for its time. You know, I think that was only good though because uh, you had yeah, we'll that kids that controller, story. the track, the trackball controller. Uh, you had the you had the trackball controller. Yeah. That was the only way to play golf. But yeah, well, well the, the multimedia era. I remember visiting studios with you around that time, and and just every. I remember we went to. Anyway, we'll get into that. I think we went to GDC or something like that. I remember them being very excited about showing Forrest Gump running on a CDI. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you parlayed yeah. this into a line of work. You contact, uh, how, how did this come about? How did you, you eventually went on to start writing for a newspaper? I mean, while we just explained arcade games, maybe we'll explain newspapers next. Yeah. Uh, so newsprint. They would put paper, newsprint yeah. on paper. I uh, actually delivered the paper in Michigan when I lived there and then got the paper out in California because uh, I needed money mm -hmm. when the Sega Genesis came out in Turbo Graphics. Those were like 200 bucks a pop. Yeah. And back then, that seemed like all the money in the world. Um, so I remember like saving up frantically for that. And um, I got to say, there's a real difference. There's a real difference to growing up in California, probably New York as well, compared to Michigan. Like Michigan was really beat down. Like we lived in Saginaw, so it's not quite Flint, but it, you could tell like the auto industry depression hit. Um, your only pathway was like, do well in school, go to college and get the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. you know, like the town that I was in. And, um, you know, it was fun. It was fun. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I had a little bit of ambition, but probably not a ton. Cause again, like I was living in Michigan, whereas in California, everybody, you know, sold a screenplay, worked for a startup, got rich doing something like there were just opportunity abound everywhere. Yeah. There's definitely like a weird, when I think, when I think back to the people we kind of grew up either with or around, whether, you know, like, you know, Josh Forbrock and his yeah show for current tv just like all this other there's just like this this weird run of like man we sure did interact with a lot of people who went on to do weird entertainment industry shit which is weird because we were in northern california not even yeah. southern california uh but yeah whether it was like founding startups and and all that other stuff like yeah. the, you know the the culture over the decades especially as i kind of got into the workforce and and all that sort of stuff it was it was wild yeah it was a really weird time yeah so I think that, okay, so I was armed with a little bit of that, like, California sense of anything can happen, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I've been living back in California for, like, a year and a half at that point. I remember going into work with my mom every day over the summer and, you know, getting paid, like, five bucks an hour just for doing, like, bullshit work um goofing off half the time go actually i was going down to japantown and like checking out import video games and import video game magazines going to movies like that was my day and i remember thinking man you know i really want to design games and i remember i had this idea for a game i remember it was going to be called fireproof not based on the kirk cameron movie uh but mm. no it's gonna be like a firefighter and like a platformer where essentially you're just going around like like spraying flames and you got like a big boss it's like a big flame monster like i mapped this all out and I remember I was like, well, you know, the, uh, I, I was reading a video game magazine and I want to say it was like Crystal Dreams or something. It was one of those uh, unauthorized Nintendo game makers. Color, color Dreams, maybe? Color Dreams. Yeah. That's right. Color Dreams. So I remember, um, I think I called them and I was just like, hey, uh, who can I send some ideas to for games? And they actually gave me the name and a fax number for like their VP of development. Oh, wow. And so I just like faxed them over, like I faxed them over, like at the time, a pretty sophisticated presentation for like, here's the plot of the game and seeing like what actual pitch decks look like. I got some of it right, but I was like, here's my idea. But then I got the standard like, hey, no, we recommend you go and pursue a degree in computer sciences or learn to program or whatever. I remember talking to my mom and I was like, okay, look, I'm about to enter my freshman year in high school. Um, best case scenario, I go to college, 
intern, do all this. Age 25 is what I'm looking at minimum. So I either need to figure out programming and do this on my own, or I got to find a other way in. And my mom on the car ride home, she actually had a really interesting light bulb idea where she said, you know, how come there's no Roger Ebert for video games? Like, how yeah. come nobody's reviewing video games the way movie critics do? And I was like, oh, that's kind of an interesting idea. And we were spitballing the idea on the 40 minute drive from San Francisco to Petaluma. And then she said, you know, if you, like she said, if you write a letter to the newspaper, like, I'll help you, I'll edit it. You know, if you write a letter in a sample column, like, I bet you they might give you a shot to, and this is the Petaluma paper, like Circulation 10,000. Right. Yeah. And she was like, if you write this in, you know, the, you, you might have a shot. You might want to do this. And I think that. Again, I remember I just called up a company cold, faxed like an entire game proposal over. So this at that point, I was like, whatever, I'm putting myself out there. But I think I learned a very important lesson uh, when the paper responded that still just rings true with me to this day, that if you have something legitimately of value to provide someone and you're willing to give it to them for essentially free, often than not, they'll take you up on that. Now, right. figuring out how to get paid from that, that's the challenge. And that probably took me the better part of 10 years to actually make any real money. But um, yeah, I had my foot in the door and I was writing for the local Petaluma newspaper um, like within, I don't know, I want to say like a week or two of having sent that initial email. And it's so funny. I mean, you want to look at how hokey the local papers are uh, like, you know, they published the announcement, you know, columnist yeah. to write about video games. <laughs> like, Great. There's me. Yep. Colum H14. There's columnists. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, I figured like that's that's that was a I don't think we realized at the time that there were a lot of other people that got into this at ages not dissimilar to ours, you know, 16, 17, 15, you know, like the uh, teenagers kind of getting into the kind of professional video game writing thing. But at the time, it felt like this very novel thing. And I'm sure the local paper was like, well, kids play these damn things anyway. We should get a kid writing about it. That'll be a novelty and people will people will take a kid seriously or, or whatever. I feel like that's not the, um, I, the, the, you know, Hey, let's exploit a kid and get them to write about video games is the kind of recurring theme of the video game media business for much of the nineties, if not still today. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, it's pretty crazy, man. So the first thing I did once they said yes, is actually called up Andy Eddy, who at the time was the editor in chief of video games, and computer entertainment. Yeah. And, Man, back then, I don't know if it's still this way, but back then, like, you could legit just call the main number of some place and ask to speak to somebody. And and I, I mean, I still don't think I sound like a grown up, but then especially, I was shocked the amount of times they would put me through yeah. to people. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you think about it, it's pre-internet. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a print magazine about video games. Like how, you know, as much as that's like a touchstone moment like like that magazine in particular you know i, I kind of put it on a pedestal for a few different reasons um you know it was what 1990 whatever yeah. and and you know the the internet wasn't a thing people people were not getting death threats not as many people had cell phones so i think people were just in a lot of ways used to answering the phone yeah. right i mean that's got to be part of it but uh yeah so so what did andy have to say so he, um, it was, it was really interesting. Everyone was very skeptical about me writing for them. And I think when they figured out that I didn't want a job, I just wanted advice. Then all of a sudden they got a lot friendlier and more open. Mm. Um, uh, cause they, they're, they're used to people saying, I want to write about video games. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he was like, well, you can call this guy for Sega. I think it was uh, Mark Smatroff at Ketchum. Mm -hmm. He's like, you can call Tom Saris at the time at Hill and Knowlton for Nintendo. And so I did, and I don't even think, I think maybe I had to fax over like the announcement or my first column just to prove that I was legit. But I right. remember Sega put me on the list right away. The first game they sent me was Ghostbusters for the Genesis. Nice. A classic. Yeah. And uh, Nintendo sent me Dr. Mario, I think was the first mm. thing I got from them. And yeah, I was off, I was off and running, man. I mean, it was, uh, it was pretty nuts. And you know, it was, it was just so funny because I'd gone through the experience of delivering the paper to make money. And then there was another event that kind of preceded all this that I think, uh, is where my mom pointed out, like the opportunity was I actually sold all my 8-bit Nintendo games, um, mm. to raise money for, uh, yeah, I think it was my Genesis and a few games. And I remember that when I was selling the games, like the parents were asking me a ton of questions or for recommendations or things like that. And so it's just weird that I went from like doing this informally to then doing it for 
the uh, the newspaper. And then what's crazier about this is it was a good couple weeks and, you know, I got to write like, oh, here's what I think are the top games. I mean, this was a weekly column I was doing, and maybe I'll post some of these on social. Yeah. Uh, they're pretty hilarious uh, for me to read now. But um, Carlo Marinucci, who was a writer for the San Francisco Examiner, had written something about the state of the industry. And I remember I'd written something kind of similar. And so my mom was like, you should send her a letter. And it was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> like, like where, where does my weird, like... <sighs> I'll, I'll tell you, on a good day, I have an overly inflated self a sense of self-confidence. Most of the other time, it was just kind of like, you know, the complete opposite. Of right. That. But uh, I wrote uh, Carla a letter, and then she called me and was like, oh, hey, you really know this stuff. And she brought me in for lunch, and then I met with the publisher of the Examiner. And um, they were like, yeah, maybe you should do something for us. And this was right before Christmas 1990. And they were like, well, like, you know, the 12 days of Christmas, why don't you write the 12 games of Christmas? And so I wrote that for the examiner. This was like four months after I started writing for uh, the Petaluma paper. But then it was CES was coming up. They said, do you mm -hmm. want to submit something from there? And then I think within like six months, I had, my column was picked up in the Argus and then the Press Democrat, which was the paper in Santa Rosa as well. So it's really weird how this snowballed, I think, in large part just due to the, the novelty of it. And right. I think that I look back on it now and like when I see myself, I mean, I get it. To adults, I was precocious. To kids my own age, I probably look pretty punchable. Uh, I see that now when I watch the old videos of myself. I'm like, sure. oh yeah, I, I get it. I get why a lot of people really don't like me. I've I've um, got tapes around. You know, the, the, we probably won't, I've got tapes of people <laughs> issuing death threats in your direction around here somewhere. <laughs> uh, if you really want to get into that, maybe we get into the public access days. We can. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. We'll we'll, we'll dive. We'll on the maybe we'll touch we'll on deep. that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll go deep on this. Uh, but no, I think um. It was a really weird predicament to be in. And then, then I started pitching myself to local radio. Um, because at this point, like I wasn't making money, all I was getting was attention and free games. Yeah. But then I met Leo Laporte because uh, I was doing KMBR, and then Leo was the fill-in DJ there, and then Leo had his radio show, which I got involved with later, and then worked at his podcast network uh back uh 12 years ago uh, mm -hmm. for, for a couple years uh recently. But um yeah, it's just crazy how it all snowballed, man. Like I don't know. I mean, so for you, because you tried, you you wrote a letter to Lucas Arts, right? You you made an attempt to get in the industry. Try is not the. I mean, yeah. Okay. The, so the, I I don't remember where this was. It might have been at school. It might have been at at Casa on a wall or something. But but maybe it was in a magazine. I'm trying to think. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have made sense for it to be at school. But anyway, they they posted something somewhere about needing QA people, someone to come in and bug test Lucas Arts games. And I would have been 15 at this point. This was definitely before I had a driver's license. So it was dumb on, a, on multiple levels. Um, but I wrote, I, I applied in the sense that I wrote them. And, and you know, having never written a resume or anything like that before, it was really just a letter. I wrote them a letter being like, hey, I like video games a lot. And uh, I'm, I play them a, a bunch. And yeah, you should, you should put me in there. I can play video games real good. Um, and they basically just wrote back and said, like, you're, you know, it, it was, it was very kind. It was, it was the, it, that I got a letter back at all, but they wrote back and said, like, you are not 18, <laughs> uh, yeah. was, was really yeah. the, the crux of it. And so it was this feeling of just like, okay, well, yeah, I mean, at least I, at least I did that thing, but I guess, you know, yeah, they're going to want adults to, to take on adult jobs and, and that, that makes sense. So, so yeah. Okay. Um, meanwhile, you know, uh, you, you know, you started your column and, you know, I did, I was not, you know, at, at age 15, I was not an avid reader of a newspaper, but my mom was. And so she would be like, Hey, this is this video game thing in the newspaper. And she would probably just cut them out for me actually, or, or, or save them for me on the, on the table. And so I, I read a handful of your columns, uh, before we met. And so I was aware of you. I was aware that like, Oh, there's this guy, Glenn who writes for the Argus and, and I'd read the stuff and be like, yeah, I don't know, man. But there was one that stuck out. Um, and that was, it, it was, it was from, I believe your first CES. Cause I, I was, I yeah. just was always, it's not, it was nothing to do with you or your takes or anything no, like that. No, no, it was, no, no. it was literally no. just like, yeah, well, I don't know if I trust any of these people about video games. Cause they say they're all good. And I'm not sure about that. Uh, well, I was going to say like Jeff, you questioning my opinion of video games is going to be a recurring theme. Yeah, probably, probably. 
probably. Um, Cause there's quite a few, there's quite a few that we had varying opinions on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I just, I was on the min max podcast yesterday with, uh, Kelsey from the video game history foundation. And they, they went through the entire game informer office and in oh, wow. there, as they were going through it, because game informer kept meticulous files, there was an issue of at the controls in there. <laughs> oh shit. So now they so now they are in possession the Video Game History Foundation is in possession of that. And so I had to explain well, that whole thing and how Ryan almost got into a fist fight. We'll get into that story probably a little bit uh about the fanzine beef that almost got us thrown out of a Namco arcade um at CES. Um anyway, oh, yeah. Damn. So so yeah, the the one thing I remember that stuck out to me th- that like really was a situation where I where it went wrong was Bill Lambeer's combat basketball. You had gone yes. to, you had gone to CES. And so this was like your column about like games that were coming out later in the year. And you had written something up about, uh, it, yeah, is this, is this it here? Yeah. Um, this is it. This is it. And if you, so you can probably see it better than I can. Can you read what you wrote about Bill Lambeer's combat basketball? Okay, so I was talking about CES 1991. This is, uh, for contextualization, this was the first CES where we saw the Super Nintendo. It was shown behind closed doors at the winter CES, but in June, Nintendo was unveiling it. And I wanted, I remember originally just to write about Super Nintendo stuff, but there was no talk about some games, do some more uh, in this. I do, I shout out Pilot Wings. Okay, Pilot Wings was my top pick. Sure, um, yeah. That's CES. Okay? That makes sense. Yeah. Final Fantasy 2. Final Fantasy 2. I think there we can yeah. agree. Worth. But my number three pick, and I'm looking at this, maybe editorial move these around because they didn't want it to, you know, they want some sports to hook the sports fans. Sure. But the number three pick ahead of Super Mario World. Just <laughs> <laughs> Super Mario. That's this Mario <laughs> game. I don't know, man. But let me tell you about the first basketball game for the Super Nintendo. <laughs> Okay, so let's uh, zoom in on this. Bill Lambeer's Combat Basketball. Not only is this game innovative in its use of great graphics, but also in concept. This is a standard basketball simulation with the regulation play of a real game, but it offers the use of weapons, rockets, landmines, and chainsaws. This is really dis- different. Uh, this is really different, in case you were wondering, and more of the old standbys could use a different twist like this. Yeah, we should put more chainsaws. Okay, I'm going to say... There are no chainsaws in Bill Lambeer's combat basketball. Uh, <laughs> they're a buzz. They're like a buzz saw, like saw blades, I guess. But anyway, yeah. So I read that and was like, basketball, but you murder each other. That does sound cool. <laughs> um, and so not long after that, you know, when those games started shipping, I found myself with a copy of Bill Lambeer's combat basketball, uh, that I had spent quite a bit of money on. And, uh, it's a terrible video game. It's a one button video game because it's a port of an Amiga game. Uh, and that was called future basketball, which is a great name. So they just went and got Bill Lambeer. I have some B roll of Bill Lambeer recording the, uh, the television spot for that game. Oh shit. That I don't know. I don't know if that has been anywhere or not. I'm not sure if that's out and around, but, uh, but I, I am in possession of that. I'll probably, I'll do, maybe I'll do something with that. Um, and so, so that was, that became how I thought of you. It was like, oh, Glenn Rubenstein. Oh, the guy from the paper. Oh, the Bill Ambeer. Com- yeah. Yeah. That guy. Um, and so before we met, that was what I thought of. I was like, oh, this guy getting his free video games and, and telling P and telling people lies in the newspaper. There ought to be a law. Um, and so some time passed, and then in my junior year, so this would have been your sophomore year yeah. of high school, I decided to take drama. And uh, that put me in a, in a beginning drama class, which with a bunch of freshmen and sophomores and stuff, because most people, by the time they were juniors, had figured out what they wanted to do. Me, not so much. Uh, so at that point, I was like, man, it'd be really fun to just do dumb shit um, and write s- sketches and stuff. And so I took drama and then immediately just started trying to rip off kids in the hall. Um, this would have been 91, 92, I guess yeah. it would have been at this point, uh, the 91, 92 school year rather. And so after a little while of doing that, uh, Ms. Gardner, who was the, the teacher there, she was like, there's someone you should meet. You should meet this guy. You should meet this guy, Glenn. He's in, he's in one of my other classes. Uh, and so 
I think she was the first person who put me on to like, you and I should probably be friends. And I don't think it was the video game thing per se. Yeah. I think it was more that you were also trying to steal. Maybe you were trying to steal SNL sketches. Like, were you doing like Hanukkah Harry or something? Okay. So this was a weird sitcom like predicament, uh, but it actually happened. So you know this because in drama class, like you're just required to perform things. And I remember I wrote some stuff early on and they were just like, you can't say this in a school play. You know, it was like too mm -hmm. provocative of an idea or just, or just, it was like dumb edgelord shit. Yep. Um, so I remember it was like, eh, like what a lot of kids, like I'm just going to do this SNL sketch that I like to this kids in the hall sketch. Um, and I remember it was a weird sitcom like predicament where for the Christmas play, I was like, I'll do Hanukkah Harry. And my drama teacher loved it so much and thought I created it that I didn't have the heart to tell her that I didn't come up with it. And I think it wasn't a year till someone pointed out to her, like, you know, Glenn didn't come up with that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It was very awkward. Yeah. Very and, awkward. And, and so I, so I was doing something pretty similar in terms of just like, you know, l lifting concepts if not sketches whole cloth from kids in the hall and that was that so that was a very prominent time i think when it comes to how things happened after that because you had a situation where comedy central was airing kids in the hall and then a program yeah. called access america kind of back to back which was like a mm -hmm. a show devoted to showing a bunch of public access television around the country and they're showing all the weird stuff that was airing and you also had wayne's world happening on saturday night live at the time and i think that those three things in my head are what led to me thinking like, man, I should start a public access show. That'd be, that'd be really cool. And I, I get the impression that you probably had the same idea from a slightly different angle. Um, yes. Although the funny thing is, do you remember at that time, something that we thought was kind of a scam that I actually found out later was a hundred percent legitimate. I'm kicking myself uh, for it because we both were fascinated by the public access idea. And I was also using the early days of AOL because I got it free. And remember when I was like, oh, hey, I was talking to this guy, Sam Simon, who works on The Simpsons. And he's encouraging me to, like, submit a spec. And I was like, what if Bart did, like, a public access show? And you were like, some older guy on the Internet. That can't be real. Um, yeah. And then I found out later that that was, like, legitimately Sam Simon. And I threw away, like, a huge <laughs> opportunity to get into TV writing because we wanted to do this dumb public access show. Yeah, that's what matters. <laughs> This is, we yeah. gotta, we gotta keep, we gotta keep it real. Another running Absolutely. theme. We've got to keep it real. Um, <laughs> spent so much of my life trying to keep it real. Yeah. Uh, to this um, very day. Um, and so yeah. I, I remember it going like that. And I, I remember meeting you not too long before you were getting ready to head back to CES because it happened yeah. twice a year at that point. And I remember the Sega CD was kind of on the cusp of kind of getting, and it was like getting talked about a lot more in magazines and stuff. And I knew that you had seen it or knew more about it than I did, but I didn't want to just like fucking roll up on you and be like, Hey dude, what the fuck is up with the Sega CD? You know, like some kind of lunatic. And, uh, but yeah, we ended up meeting and, and hanging out and, and hitting it off. And I, yeah, I feel like it wasn't too long after that before you were kind of roping me into just like kind of rolling with you to some of these video game things. Well, you're forgetting a big part of it. Uh, okay, so not one, the first time I ever had a recollection of who you were. Yeah. Because I was TA in drama and I was floating between periods. Basically, okay, right. because I was leaving so much to do video game stuff, like school and me, sophomore year, it was pretty clear like school and me are done. Like this ain't. Yeah, bad. and then after you and, and I started doing public access, I think school and me were kind of feeling pretty done not long after that yeah um so my first recollection of you by name was you got up for drama and you did it might have been before i even saw it on tv you did gavin from kids in the hall yeah like spot on mm -hmm. uh you know for the hundred dollar patreon tier jeff gersman will yeah. recreate gavin sketches for you that's right verbatim personally because yeah. uh, he's very good he's very good the definitive version of the character that's in right my mind. Yeah. but uh so we were talking about that and we're talking about sketch comedy and I'm trying to remember the other thing with public access. Cause I knew it was available like in Petaluma and I was like, we should do this. But pretty shortly after we met, we would start leaving school for lunch. And then pretty shortly after that, we would start not coming back to school. Um, we would go to Seven Eleven, we would get nachos and big bites mm -hmm. and big gulps and then go to your house and watch basically kids in the hall through short attention span theater. We would just watch an afternoon of comedy central hanging yeah. out on your bed. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, sitting on the edge of my bed watching TV for sure. Your your waterbed. Yeah, your water that's bed. right. I, that's right. I had the waterbed at that point. It's pretty dope. It was so classy. Yeah, let me, uh, yeah, contextualize here just so people can get the visual here of yeah. uh, 
Glenn Rubenstein and Jeff Gersman circa 1992. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there, there, there's, uh, yeah, that guy. I'll dig super, out. I'll, I'll, sc I'll scan in some of my, uh, some of my, uh, high school photos oh. there. Yeah. There's yeah. Okay. Uh, -huh. that was when the, I, I don't know why that photo is so washed out, but this is before this is as the acne was coming for me. And then uh, it hits it, us all. yes, it, it hit me very hard, but this is probably not long before it did. That is in my bedroom. Uh, that, that poster I think was on the back of my door. Um, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, and then yes, you had a, yes. So that's, that sounds about right. Yeah. The, the, once I got my driver's license, it felt like there were not a ton of great reasons to come back to school after lunch. My junior year, I had a Spanish class that I absolutely detested. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Once I had a driver's license, it was, you know, it was, it was easy to leave for lunch and then just go like, wait, there's nothing. I mean, other than the law that says we're supposed to go back, there's no law that says we're supposed to go back. So yeah, it, it became extremely easy to just ditch those last two classes and, and go do something else, which I feel like a lot of kids would go and do drugs and then. We were like, no, let's go watch John Stewart and Patty Rossborough on Short Attention Span Theater. That's what truly matters. Oh, absolutely. Well, and then there were things that we were talking about earlier. So Sega, um, and I posted the photo of that, but I'll, I'll pop it up here. Like Sega sent a limo to my house and you and I got taken down to Sega for the day. And what's crazy about this, like, look at this now. And it, it's, it's just like, man, I mean, another thing I'm going to own up to, I'm sure a lot as we go through and start doing this, it was like my ego my entitlement like i was mm -hmm. definitely an asshole for probably let's just say the majority of the 90s um before life sort of kicked the shit out of me and i think i came back down to earth a little bit but um yeah i mean sega was like sending limos taking us both down there like oh hey you want an extra genesis or sega cd here you go uh you know let's talk about these games we're working on we're just hanging out with like uh, the cmo you know and everyone is like catering to us in a way that yeah when i look at it now it's um it's interesting right because like you were saying okay so there's definitely on one hand like editorial outlets that aren't really compensating younger people they're taking uh advantage of the situation and services but i absolutely look back at it now and it was like okay it was a bit of a mark because it was pretty easy to, I mean, for instance, Bill Ambeer's combat basketball was at CES, met Bill Ambeer, was playing it, and I was like, this is kind of rudimentary. And they were like, oh, no, no, this is only like 20% done. Right. When this is finished, it's going to be great. And uh, it's part of the reason why, like, I, I, just, I always hated working on previews of games yeah, because yeah. It, it's so overly positive and disingenuous. And, um, before I knew better, because again, I wasn't a journalist, like, I was a kid that knew how to write and talk, but, um, yeah, it was like way too influenced by whatever razzle dazzle people were throwing at me yeah and i think that's that's until you you know until you work for somebody who sets you straight like uh, yeah totally that that makes sense it wasn't until i worked for ron doolin at GameSpot for a while there yeah. and he ran reviews there and was just like no fuck these people and i was like oh right yes i mean this, this may be a hard line stance but but at the same time yes like we, we are not necessarily buddy buddy um but yeah i mean that it was but as someone who wasn't doing anything for a living at all other than being a high school kid the idea of like tagging along with you two sega and hanging out with doug glenn and talking yeah. about um the make your own music video franchise that they were working on and how big of a deal that was going to be and and how they like oh yeah we, we're going to use all this extra footage they have laying around because after these music video shoots i'm sure they have a bunch of it no they, they turns out they did not but they uh not. they do not uh very tightly run operations music video shoots it turns out um and and so yeah like we you know i got to see spencer nielsen's office where the echo the dolphin cd soundtrack was probably recorded in his little studio there in their building and yeah it was like we were suddenly suddenly i had to own a sport coat to put over my t-shirt to look at least like somewhat legit like that photo, uh, not which didn't work. It did not look legit, but, um, and, and we were talking to people like Tom Kalinske and Ellen Beth Van Buskirk and, and all these people at, at Sega on like a, a somewhat regular basis, you know? Yeah. And, oh, I remember, I mean, and I look back on it now. And so the opportunities that I did get were like just incredible in hindsight. I mean, I was one of the original contributors to wired magazine and I think right. I stopped 
they didn't stop asking me. Like I was just like, oh, I've submitted like five things. I was, I was in the first five issues. Who knows how long this is going to last? Uh, and you wrote for you know, Wizard I mean, for a while too, yeah, I wrote right? For Wizard for a bit. Um, I mean, I was doing like radio, TV. I auditioned for the original game pro tv which was a disaster yeah um, but it would have been if you would if you had gotten that job though that would have been kind of neat but that show I, I actually recently watched an episode of game pro tv what a yeah an absolute nightmare of a program yeah which, they wanted me to be the news guy so if you watch that first episode that news thing i'm sure there's a terrible audition of me doing that somewhere right uh and in, in the uh, game pro archives i wrote for game pro i would think i got one review in game pro super mario all-stars uh so whenever that came out did you have so to I, pick yeah, a fake it. name yeah what, what do you think my fake name was jeff what, what do you think oh was it was it g-man it was G-Man, which is weird because i saw somebody in the comment refer to you as g-man and i was like yeah. holy like, shit no but I was like, why did we never realize that that is like a way better name for Jeff than for me? Yeah, I guess it, it fits because because with, with we should have both used it, but I, mine would have been with two N's. Oh, there you go. There yeah. you go. That would have made all the sense in the world. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, like, look, there's a lot of stuff we're going to dive into yeah. as we talk about this. I mean, we, we ran a BBS together in the early 90s. Right. Uh, we were in a hip hop group together for like probably three years yeah three years yeah uh, something, two or, something like that years. you you carried uh, on uh without me at, at a certain point that. but uh but yes we opened for the bloodhound gang well you know what's funny and i'll talk about this my my uh star i just had to google to see if he's alive and i'm not sure if he is so i'm not going to mention him by name but uh the the head of one of the mul multimedia companies that made the bad games mm -hmm. like he later went on to do something in the music industry and uh my, the bad things i said about his games legitimately cost me a quarter of a million dollar music opportunity because <laughs> he was still pissed i bet uh about uh some of my harsh words about the lack of interactivity so i mean yeah there's there's just so much um and it's weird for me too because I, I feel this is going to be you know somewhat therapeutic i hope people get some value out of this i mean we're definitely going to talk more about games and the stories behind them but i just feel like there's just so much history that you and i it comes up when we talk but we've never really done a deep dive into all this right and i think uh you know there's other people that are part of these stories that hopefully yeah. we can reach out to and 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 get in here as well i know you know for me it's you know it's people like andy mcnamara who's at ea now uh i'd love yeah. to talk to tom byron who has, did did a ton of different stuff across the industry for a very long time uh and and so on and so forth so we're definitely gonna be reaching out to people uh to try to get them to kind of tell their pieces of the story as it goes um and and see how it all works out. But yeah, there's there's like a lot of stories because there's a lot of stuff that I feel like I remember reasonably well. But like you are you have already filled in a bunch of gaps on stuff. They're like, oh, right. When it comes to like that time in the early 90s when we went to a company and played a VR game before yeah. that was really a thing. <laughs> and and all of the, you know, and, and, and our time at uh, at uh, our time working in Berkeley on a magazine. Oh, my God. And that was the first time I ever saw a super wild card, the SNES copier in person and uh, all sorts of all sorts of weird stuff. Uh, but we're going to start the the first proper Patreon only episode. We are going to talk Nintendo and yeah. we are specifically going to get into the Game Genie and the Nintendo Galoob lawsuit about the Game Genie, which you ended up playing a fairly pivotal role in. Yes, expert and witness. Expert witness, court. Glenn Rubenstein, on behalf of Galoob. And mentioned in the judge's preliminary ruling that my testimony as an actual consumer was more uh, a swaying than all of the quote-unquote experts that Nintendo put on the stand. Yeah. Pretty nuts. Yeah, Pretty yeah. Nuts. Some other things that happened. Well, yeah, there's some, there's some stuff around Nintendo that... Because that was, you know, a around the things. yeah, a couple of things, and and that, that Nintendo was one of the first companies I ever called, yeah, and said, even though I had one already, I think there was just some like I should get used to this, and I was like, hey, uh, you got a holiday bundle for the Super Nintendo, you should send me one of those, and how fucking terrifying that was, um, but they sent it, so uh, but come on, calling Nintendo one eight hundred four two 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 exactly, yeah, yeah, just I just mean, call them up on, and ask all, for a SNES, it shows up exactly. You know, yeah, you, you mean, just yeah. ask for Eileen and, uh, 
everything will work out. Um, but you know, I called her uh, when I was doing the short lived video game podcast to Twit. Oh, really? And everything you see it on Facebook because all the PR people from back then, like when I turned 40, the comments were a collective nervous breakdown <laughs> from people realizing how long it had been that I was turning 40 years old. Yeah. Pretty yeah. Nuts. Yeah. That is, uh, that, that is pretty crazy. Uh, but so, yes, so we'll, we'll get into well, um, Nintendo yeah, next I think time. We're going to talk, uh, yeah, and their iron grip. I think really that era where they were losing their iron grip is the most fascinating. Um, and then from there, probably Sega's emergence, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff. And I think as we go through linear, uh, in a linear fashion in the timeline, I mean, we're definitely going to jump around. But yeah. then you'll also see, I mean, we'll have like when we met Ryan the first time back in music. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. We can't tell these stories without talking about, uh, you know, Brendan, uh, who we also lost yep. a few years ago, uh, who your audience knows as the Ricker. But Brendan was like front and center. And if you want to talk about ambition, like we're going to tell some Brendan stories that like make the stuff that we attempted to do look like nothing. Yeah. Like like Brendan. Brendan had an ankle bracelet at one point. That's how ambitious he was. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, he, Brendan would try anything. Uh, he would try to get away with anything. Literally. Um Yes, and 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 definitely, I I want to if we can yeah if we can get a hold of uh, Ryan McDonald or uh, to hear some of his versions. The story I want to talk about, and I know you can probably talk about it just fine. But the stuff I want to hear about is the video game spot launch tour where oh, you shit. where you convinced the company to pay Brendan to be your driver. And you drove around the East Coast, the Midwest to the East Coast, you and Ryan McDonald and Brendan, uh, and went to different radio stations and went and saw the Insane Clown Posse live and uh, and all this this other stuff. I was not allowed to go on that trip, and it was a bummer, uh, but because it sounded ridiculous. But it also sounds like I would have just been pissed the whole time. So you would have been, and that's the funny thing because I was I had to remember this. It's funny now the world we live in, but I also remember at that age, like you didn't want to leave your house a lot like, yeah. to go do events or to travel to things like that really changed. I think music changed that uh, uh, when we were doing touring, like then it was more commonplace, but I was the same way too. I mean, I used to get invited to launch events and things all the time and just be like, oh, I got to drive to San Francisco or, right. oh, it's going to take up an entire day. And I look back now and I just want to slap myself yep. because there's so many interesting opportunities. But yeah, I think uh, McDonald got some epic stories with McDonald, uh, talk about some of the, the more colorful characters we met in this business. Mm -hmm. I mean, hell, let's try and track down Thor Ackerland and just get the real deal scoop. That's right. Know? Yes. Uh, yeah, the, the, the real deal from, from Thor for sure. Um, yeah, we can talk, maybe we'll, we'll talk about the guy who at one point tried to convince us that he knew everything that was going to be in street fighter three. And I was gullible in a weird way at the time that I was like, Oh man, he said there's going to be a cowboy in it. I'm like, Hmm. And this would have, this was like over five years before there even was a street fighter three. I don't even think super street fighter two was even out at this point when he was trying to tell us these stories. Um, yeah, the eavesdropper. Oh, that's right. The fucking he's yeah. that fucking guy. All right. All right. That, that's, we got, we got a lot. There's a, a lot. whole, yeah, there's a whole hour. We'll have to figure out how many, how, how some of these people get referred to by not their name, um, in, in certain situations, but yes, there's a lot to go through for sure. And so we will get into that. Uh, and next time we will talk about Nintendo and, and as Glenn said, the, the whole thing they did with, uh, you know, they had an, that iron grip through the NES and, and as Sega started to get real about it with the Genesis and how that changed a lot of things and the plate loud air, all that stuff. Yeah. We'll get into all that stuff that is going to appear on patreon.com at the co-conspirator tier or higher. You head over to patreon.com slash Jeff Gerstman or enjoy your gaming.com, which, uh, is a, a URL that someone registered. I, I need to set a better URL still, but yes, go over to patreon.com slash Jeff Gerstman uh, to get all of that and more. We will have the first proper episode of this coming up very soon, as well as the next edition of the Jeff Gerstman Hall of Fame, which is a Patreon uh, timed exclusive. So go over there, check out the offering, and, uh, and give it a look, and we'll see you soon. As Thanks we go everyone. from Game Boys to men. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> I guess that's the name now. I guess that's I guess that's the name now. All right, thanks everybody. That's the name now. See you next time.
Thanks.